what's, what's the Jesus tag? All right, ready to get started up again. Dana's going to take us through to lunch. So he's going to start off by talking to us about overtopping of walls and stilling basin failure. And then we're going to discuss uh, some fundamentals about cavitation and provide some really interesting case, uh, case studies from cavitation incidents that we've seen. And then we'll go to lunch. So Dana has the privilege of taking up most of the morning, but he's a dynamic guy, so I don't think it's too hard for us to listen to him. So, Dana, go ahead. Can you guys hear me? All right. So, bad spot to be in between you guys and lunch, but we're going to go kind of quick, and we're going to, unless you guys want to, pause on something and we'll talk about overtopping of walls, stilling basin failures, and then go into a cavitation presentation. Um, some of it's a bit redundant, so I'll try not to hit those points too much. But first is the wall overtopping and stilling basin failures. So we'll go through some of the things that affect the assessment of shoot wall overtopping and then move to stilling basins and talk about some common stilling basin issues and potential for incidents and failures. And then as everything else, we'll go through an inventory. All right, so one of the reasons these evaluations come up pretty often because is because our understanding of extreme flood hydrology is, is really uncertain and it's changed and progressed a lot over the decades. So many of our older structures are, are not designed for what we now estimate to be um, the potential extreme flood hydrology loading. And that's really presented itself in common um, case histories of failures. So 30% of failures in the U.S. are associated with overtopping. So we're not talking about overtopping of the embankment or the dam. In this case, we're talking about the overtopping of the hydraulic structures. So shoot wall overtopping. Um, I guess I'll talk a lot about I guess the interrogation of the original design intent, because I think that's really valuable once we get into a um, to an assessment. So, what I like to do is try to understand what the original design hydrology was, um, how it's changed, how that hydrology was adopted in the development of the hydraulic structures design criteria. So, in this case, the shoot wall overtopping. Um, how much freeboard did they have in relation to the original design discharge? Is that freeboard eaten up with hydrology alone? Is it exceeded? Um, did it account for some three-dimensional effects that we'll talk about? Um, did it account for air bulking? Those kind of things. All right, so a bit on convergence and divergence of shoot walls. It, I think it's, it's relatively common, maybe, that um, for, especially for smaller structures that we may converge, diverge um, shoots for economy, but not fully evaluate them as far as the impacts on, on the flow characteristics. So if sometimes that's considered in freeboard and sometimes it's neglected, but that, that's a bit of a smoking gun that, that this could be a potential problem. Because what happens when you converge and um, you have obstructions and flows like piers, you get shock waves and cross waves, and those things can be quite complicated and hard to predict of, of what their impact could be, but they can result in overtopping at, at lower discharges. And you may have assessed if you just looked at it in upstream, downstream, um, sectional perspective. So these are just some photographs to illustrate, I guess, what we mean when we talk about 3D effects. So the top left, I'll go to this side. So the, the the top left is work done by USDA ARS on converging stepped shoots and the shock waves that can occur. We could we have similar shock waves on um, smooth shoots, but something to that's somewhat hard to predict and can be fairly significant. Um, the right is a straight weir section and a converging shoot, just showing that shock waves develop as um, the shoot converges and those or cross waves, and those waves actually cross and impact even downstream into the terminal structure. So it's not just the chute that, that may be a concern. And then the bottom just shows that these things can cross and propagate far downstream. 
All right, this is actually Oroville Dam at I think we're at 110,000 CFS and there is no lower chute so you can kind of see some mist but you see just the piers alone send out pretty significant um, cross waves, shock waves that, that could affect if we're higher discharges and higher flow conditions. There's, um, you know, air, air bulking is also a consideration. It, this, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes just by looking at flow if it's actually bulked for the full depth or if it's just surface aeration. In this case, it's really just surface aeration and mainly associated with the piers. You really have to go through, um, there's, there's a program from USBR, it's called Z-Profile, that can help you assess this, but you really need to look at how long does it take a turbulent boundary layer to actually grow to the free surface and then fully aerate back down. This is also important to cavitation. Um, there, there's some ways we'll talk about in, um, in a minute that, that can help you assess this. But in general, if it's a low, a moderately low slope, say less than 10%, you probably won't get the fully aerated flow. All right, this is just to illustrate there are some methods out there um, to estimate when we may or may not have significant influence due to convergence and it's a function of the fruit number um which uh, you know the fruit number is the probably my my favorite number <laughs> it's the more circle for a hydraulic engineer um kind of thing but um it's you know the relationship of the inertial to the gravitational forces but it tells us a lot about how the flow is going to behave all right so there's there's also ways to estimate super elevation if if things aren't Symmetric, you know, symmetrical and uniform, it's complicated. But there are some empirical ways that we can put a coefficient in front of some fundamental things like the velocity of width and the um, radius of curvature to be able to estimate what the, the super elevation might be. All right, so air bulking and flow, this one's tough because uh, often our hydraulic basis of design is either going to be a physical model, which doesn't get air right, or a CFD, which generally doesn't get air right. So um, we generally fall back on em empirical studies from, from larger scale or prototype tests. But it can be significant, especially on steep chutes. So I'm not gonna get a whole lot into details of estimating the, the air bulking, but there are methods out there in USBR EM41 and 42 are both helpful um, that really give you step-by-step step on how you can go about estimating chute air entrainment and the resulting bulking. But it's gonna be a function of the turbulent boundary development. That's maybe a key key point. So there is some length associated generally on the chute and generally steep chutes, as this points out, you can see how the, the, air, the air content, the air concentration gets higher with the steeper chutes at uniform depth. All right, so this is just a quick illustration of of what I was talking about with the boundary layer development. So this is an idealized case to where we have some control structure, a steep chute. And as we get higher velocity, you know, the, the boundary layer, the turbulence along caused by that surface roughness grows. And if it grows to the free surface and it starts, it, it exceeds the ability, the surface tension in the water and it starts entraining air. And when that air entrainment fully develops back to the bottom of the chute, generally we, we consider that to be uniform flow conditions and that will progress at the similar velocity and depth all the way down in air concentration. When we talk about cavitation, it's not to the point to where we get the air back down to the boundary that we can generally allow on aeration to minimize cavitation. So that's why we typically put air ramps if, if it's a big concern, because there can be quite a distance before you get to that, um, that aeration back down to the free boundary. But again, you can see self aeration is a function of the, the slope as well. Um, I guess what do you what do you think is causing is is this self aerated flow through the water column or if, is this just surface aeration? Be misleading. I think this is just surface aeration. It's the turbulence over the gate. So this, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's the turbulence as that high pressure goes to zero, essentially, as it comes under the gate. But that won't help cavitation. Um, not that cavitation is an issue on this spillway, but just something to point out. All right, we had 
a bit of a question on on F1 about air balking. So there, there are ways to estimate this. Um, and I think one thing, and, and we do that based on the air concentration and just putting it to the ratio of the, the clear water depth that we would calculate. But one thing that, that's interesting that I don't know how often it, it actually comes into play, but as the water aerates, it loses the frictional resistance. So you actually increase velocity and the equivalent clear water can, can be smaller than you would calculate otherwise. So that's what you see on this figure as this diverges down. So this clear water depth, this is the bulk depth, but this is the equivalent depth if you didn't adjust the velocity, if that makes any sense. So to your point about aeration, you, you might want to think about reducing the, the clear water depth as well and really high velocity flows that's actually resisting on the slab. All right, so still in basin sweep out. Um, this can be something that was either made worse by increasing hydrology or understanding of hydrology, or it could be general design philosophy was to allow some sweep out and, and at, at extreme events and hope for the best. Um, what we find is there's also, you know, going back to the fruit number, there's also different characteristics of sweep out. So when we say sweep out, it's not a universal term. When we go to higher fruit numbers, which are high velocity, low depth, we generally see some pretty severe consequences of sweep out. If we're in, in the USACE portfolio, we have a lot of um, really low fruit numbers um, for, for lower head dams with really high unit discharge. And the sweep out of those structures does, does not, it's really not a major regime change. So that might be something to think about. But generally what we're talking about with sweep out is for whatever reason, tailwater retrogression, retrogression um, design considerations, increasing hydrology, or just intent, designer's intent w was to have it go through this condition. We don't have enough tailwater to hold the hydraulic jump in the location that it should be, which is the toe of the chute. And it, it rapidly progresses um, the, the depth and the velocity downstream. And when it gets down there, it sprays off the baffles. And if there's an end seal here, it projects it like a flip bucket and it can be problematic as far as scour. Um, at least for, you know, the, the USACE basins and the USBR standard basins, we do have pretty good relationships to where we can estimate when this sweep out's gonna occur. And it's usually somewhere around 0.85 times um, the, the con conjugate depth that we, we learned about in basic hydraulics. So you can compute that. If you have baffles, it's gonna be something smaller than that generally, and we can estimate it. Um, ball milling is, I'm sure a lot of your dams and your consultants dams, you probably witnessed some of this because it's really typical that we put durable stone downstream of um, not as durable concrete. And if we get certain hydraulic conditions, we can entrain that stone back into the stilling basin. Those are just tools that, that can work to destroy the concrete. Um, this is just a graphic of, of what can happen. Um, USBR has actually done some, some good work recently for mitigating devices to, to retrofit. So if you've got problems with, with your structures, maybe that's something to consider. Um, and it, it, it can lead to to damage and could lead to incidents and failures. I'm not aware of any actual breaches associated with this mechanism because it is a very time dependent process. And they're in your chapters and in the slides, they're just case histories of um, how far, how long it took to get one inch, um, just to give some relative time durations. So this is going to be one of those failure modes, like we'll talk about with cavitation too, to where it's a very time dependent process and robust inspection, monitoring, repairs can um, generally generally take care of these failure modes. Maybe there's some instances out there with thin linings and erodible foundations where this could be a single event um, failure mode, but often it's an operation and maintenance. Um, if there's not deferred operations, maintenance and repair, um, it could be minimized and avoided. All right, case histories. Um, El, Guapo, El Guapo Dam in Venezuela is the classic, classic shoot wall over top in case history. Um, and its original design hydrology was just basically transferred. 
And during construction, it started construction in 1975, finished up in 1980. And during that period, they actually exceeded um, their inflow design and, and had some overtopping. Um, didn't fail, so they modified, they added a tunnel spillway, and um, I guess about 20 years later, they got a bigger flood than, than that updated night hydrology, and it led to shoot while we were topping. So here's the approach to the shoot, just to give kind of some context of the spillway. Uniform slope, relatively steep, down to a hydraulic jump stone basin. So here is the 1999 spillway event that ultimately breached the dam, but here's before it breached the dam, and you can see that sweep out, right? So hydraulic jump stone basin is not supposed to look like that. Um, you can start to see some, some overtopping of the upper chute. Here's just a close-up of that overtopping. I um, mean, you can see a bit of the progression. And then ultimately, it scoured out, undermined the chute slabs, lost section of the chute slabs, maintained the, the actual crest slab for some time. It was founded on decomposed um, rock, so it was pretty readable material. And then ultimately, it breached. Um, you know, this is one of those incidents that led to breach, and the breach led to life loss. It's estimated somewhere between 10 and 20. I don't think the exact number's at least published. Uh, but it impacted over 10,000 people. There's just the aftermath of the breach. They did rebuild it in the 2000s, so um, there's a new roller compacted concrete. I think in our best practices chapter, it was 30,000 acre feet listed, and I'm not sure if that's the original. Um, in the newer information I've seen, it's, a, it's over 100,000, so I don't know if they upgraded it when it was reconstructed or not. So somewhere in between 30 and 100,000. Thousand acre feet, uh, and I, I read it or understood it to be a municipal water supply reservoir. All right, typical event tree. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We get flow that results in wall overtopping. We get some scouring erosion that leads to this continued problem of either head cutting along the side or undermining and, and directly into shoot slab failures and progression through the head cut back into erosion of rock and soil. Um, intervention is unsuccessful. Again, with spillways, interventions generally talking about um, gated structures that we can intervene operationally. It progresses to breach. All right, so stilling basin is essentially the same thing, but we started the stilling basin, so don't need to spend a lot of time there. All right, so some of the key considerations is, um, well, fun fact about um, El Guapo, the original prior to the upgrade, uh, the inflow design flood for the original design that was translated from another basin that was exceeded during construction to the current PMF that the, the ultimate RCC spillway section was upgraded to, that PMF, increased 27 times. So I, I know we talk in, in flood hydrology a lot about this uncertainty in this direction, you know, given the PMF, what's the probability? but don't underestimate or don't overestimate, I guess, is, is one of my big takeaways from a lot of hydrology studies, our ability to predict what that upper limit is. So maybe it's conservative, maybe it's not, but it, it definitely seems to warrant consideration. You know, if we're making absolute judgments of safe or not safe based on the PMF, that we, we understand, you know, the uncertainty and the potential direction that uncertainty would take us if we knew more. Um, convergence, divergence, you know, anything that's not symmetric and uniform is going to create anomalies in the flow that, that are sometimes hard to predict and will only increase the flow depth, right? So, you know, watch out for those things. Were they included in the original design? Is there a good basis for their inclusion in the original design, and is there a way to analyze it now? Um, CFD is actually, in my opinion, a, a really good tool for those type of problems where flow is not highly turbulent, but it, there's there's pressure and velocity things going on. Um, are there cross waves? You know, this any anomalies are going to create things that are shock waves or cross waves or divergence, convergence. Um, super elevation, these aren't super common, and hopefully the ones that, that 
that you run across do have some good basis of design, but it's it's always something to look for. And air balking can often be overlooked and wrapped into you know an arbitrary freeboard number in many cases. Um, and depending on actual flow conditions, freeboard might not be enough. So it's always something to to maybe work through in a back of the envelope um, type analysis to see if you think the air balking ratios are prudent. Um, ball milling, you probably see some signs of this, and I'm sure many of you guys have probably seen projects that have ball milling damage. It's it's generally associated with stilling basins that inherently have thicker slabs, but it could be an issue, something to look at, and stilling basin sweep out. Um, I guess a big takeaway for me on sweep out is not all sweep outs the same, and it's not all equal. So pay special, pay special attention to high fruit numbers, so high velocity, low flow depths with inadequate tailwater. Those can really result in, in pretty dynamic and turbulent um, jets that, that can attack right the places you don't want immediately downstream. In seals are also highly effective generally on stilling basins. So a more likely factor in my mind would be a stilling basin that's suspect to sweep out and doesn't have in seals. Um, Paradise Dam, which Manal went over there earlier, um, it was an RCC apron with minimally dowed in seals. It operated fine until they lost the end seal due to dynamic vibrations and whatnot that, that dislodged the end seal. And then you, you saw the dramatic head cut right at the, the failure location associated with that. It wasn't sweep out, but it was loss of that vital end seal that minimizes the hydraulic attack right downstream. All right, configuration and intervention. This is really, is it gated and can you shut the gates? All right, so. Um, to take away points, flood hydrology is uncertain in both directions, so um, it's going to change, right? It's like a geologic interpretation with more data. It's, go it's going to change, um, and understanding which direction is probably going to change from whatever you're evaluating is always good. Flow's 3D. Um, it's very 3D when the geometry is 3D, so the more 3D the, you know, the, the configuration gets, the, the more it's going to affect the flow. Um, air entrainment, if the basis of design is physical modeling, um, and it wasn't adjusted for air balking, question it. If it's CFD and it was or wasn't adjusted for air balking, question it and, and make some some fundamental adjustments based on the literature out in USBREM 41. Um, look for trigger points is always an important thing for all systems, right? And these are systems. Look for things like tailwater. That if we drop a foot of tailwater, do we have a high incoming velocity, low flow depth that can rapidly turn a, a stilling basin into a flip bucket? Um, and, you know, gates, we often, in our program, we always look at intervention and non-intervention. And, and most of these failure modes, the intervention is associated with gates. 